Welcome back to the most fabulous podcast in the world, a world of vicarious madness. Today we're taking a detour over to Russia. Ooh, what's going on in Russia? Well, first, I want you to imagine a stage. Lights dimmed, the soft murmur of the crowd, the music swells, and a woman wrapped in silk scarves steps into the light. That woman is Ida Rubinstein. Ooh. Shocking. Scandalous. Oh, you, you have no idea. We're just <laughs> beginning. So so let's, let's go back to the, the very beginning, a very good place to start. Um, so how, what are her origins? So she's born in 1885 in the Russian Empire as Lydia, which is very quickly shortened to Ida. Her parents, however, died in a typhus epidemic when she was two years old. So she is sent with her older sister to her aunt, Madame Horwitz, in St. Petersburg. Rather unusual for Russian Jews at the time, they didn't live in a ghetto and they were a very wealthy family. Like expensive grounds and greenhouses with exotic fruits. So how did they manage this? They were involved in banking and trade. Mm. So they kind of got shielded from the, the oppression of their peers because they were they were too indispensable to the Gentiles because of the trade. For a comparison at the time, it is said that hunger and poverty were so acute outside of the Pale of Settlement that there were many stories of people resorting to cannibalism. Oof. Yeah, sounds like a rough time. So <laughs> they were very lucky, I guess. Yes, and as befitting a very wealthy woman, she naturally had a French governess and an extensive education. In fact, she was a polyglot. Ooh, which which languages did she speak? So, at one point, she had Russian, English, French, German, and Italian, and it's said that she picked up others throughout her life. A lot of stories tell of when people from all over Europe would work on her productions with her, she would take the time to speak to each person in their native tongue. That's really sweet of her. Or show offy. I guess we'll have to see who she is. Yes, well, also, naturally, she has an interest in ancient Greece and the language. Mm -hmm. Now, also, relatively normal for the time, she took private ballet classes, and I say normal for the upper class at the time. However, she soon scandalizes her aunt by wanting to actually perform on stage for people. It seems like there's a pattern of uh, women are encouraged to be interested in the arts uh, for their own edification, but once they try to do things on their own, under their own name, and actually make money off of it, Oh no, too much of a scandal. You know, that's, she basically a sex worker at that point. Um, and of course, we know that that's the worst profession to have, <laughs> which is really silly. Like, like women are only allowed to be interested in art at this time. It's funny you mentioned that because her family actually did think of her being an actress or a professional ballet dancer instead of just a socialite was Far too close to being a courtesan. Right, which is, can I just say, so weird, because being a socialite, in a lot of ways, more closely mirrors being a courtesan, in terms of, like, being a person who uh, engages with other people of the higher classes and tries to be welcoming and friendly and sometimes even flirty with people. Like, the distinction there really is that the courtesan is specifically attached to a person who pays them, or, you know, several people who pay them. But being a socialite, you know, you're still you're still trading in this currency of fame and also gifts. I don't know what her family was on, except I guess the social attitudes at the time. Yes. So we are now in the year 1905. She's 20 years old. And against the backdrop of the failed 1905 revolution, which involved Bloody Sunday, where protesters wanted to speak to the czar and were shot in the streets. So there's some political unrest. There's some turmoil. Yes, and against this backdrop, she goes to Leon Basque, the renowned costume designer and future member of the Ballet Russe, 
with her plan to produce and star in Antigone. Okay. So this is a fairly controversial story. Do you, do you want to give us a brief um, Antigone summary? Antigone is a tragic Greek play that focuses on the main character of Antigone, the daughter of Oedipus, and how her brothers are slain in battle and she is not allowed to touch them or she'll die as well. Like, she can't give them burial. She disobeys, gives them burial, and ends up dead. So, we have a strong and controversial woman. Um, an interesting choice for an aristocrat's daughter to do. I don't know. Aristocrat. An interesting choice for a wealthy woman to go for. Yes, well, she did have an interest in ancient Greece and ancient Greek language, as we noted. So she goes to Leon Basque with this plan. He is concerned. She is not dissuaded. In fact, she travels all the way to Greece and does her research. Wow. All right. She is committed. Fully committed. This is a trend in the life of Ida Rubinstein, as we shall see. Mm -hmm. So they compromise on a private show rather than a public debut right then. So it's far less scandalous. Mm -hmm. So it's just like friends and family invited? Yeah, a much more closed group of people. Something much more acceptable for a socialite dabbling with the arts. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It's, you know, recital rather than uh, her actually having a stage career. Yes, and the play is a success. Wow. So even though she's dealing with this like controversial subject matter... She manages to carry it off. Yes. Now, it is about this time that she meets Sergei Diaghilev, the founder of the Ballet Russe, though he has not founded it yet. And they wouldn't collaborate really quite yet, but it lays the foundation for all of that. Gotcha. So this is the foreshadowing part. Yes. Instead, she goes and finds someone to translate Oscar Wilde's Salome. The scandalous show involving the lead woman stripping seven veils off her new body, leaving her naked on stage. Love it. So, so one controversial female character to another. Yes. Bast designs the costumes and she focuses on her dancing. What I do love is that she isn't just doing this for the scandal of it all. It seems like she's she really sees these roles as meaty roles that she wants to like put all of her skill into. Now, at one point, she and the first draft of the script go to Paris in 1908 to visit her sister and her sister's doctor husband. Both of these individuals are highly scandalized at her plans and threaten to get her locked in an asylum. Wow! <laughs> That's a bit extreme. Uh, they beg Ida to give this up to keep being respectable instead. Naturally, Ida refuses. Right, bad chance of that. So her doctor brother-in-law uses his medical credentials and pool to get her institutionalized in St. Cloud for mental instability. Okay. Talk about ethical violations there. <laughs> they just... They did not have our ethical standards back then. Whew. Well, they thought they were doing the right thing. Right, because clearly, I mean, if you if you look at it from their kind of social perspective, I can see where, like, she is ruining her future for herself, basically. And so she must be out of her mind if she doesn't see that this is, you know, basically committing suicide. Yes, and this causes a rift in the family. Her aunt hears about this and arranges for her freedom and prompt return to Russia, but still disapproved of her doing this, but didn't want to go so far as to put her... In an asylum for it. Right. No, her aunt was at least like, you don't deserve medical abuse because you want to, like, do something controversial. Wild times. Yes, this is also the time where an unmarried woman can't really have direct access to her inheritance without meddling relatives and therefore her independence unless she marries. Mm-hmm. So Ida very quickly married a cousin, Vladimir Horwitz, who was in love with her. And he agreed to a marriage blanc, an unconsummated marriage, and to not interfere with her career ever. Wow. Well, that sounds like a really great deal for her. But um, 
if she doesn't like him, poor guy. Oh, yeah. He apparently may have believed that she would change her mind after the wedding. Mm-hmm. Because, right, because he's like, oh, she's so pure and virginal and, you know, she just doesn't want to think about sex right now because she's so, you know, she's such an innocent um, or something. I don't know. Guys, guys do sometimes have this thing about like, well, I maybe she doesn't like guys, but I'll, I'm different. But anyway, she does not change her mind. Instead, she immersed herself in producing Salome. This included crossing the Syrian desert to Palestine right after her wedding which spawned rumors of Arabian princes offering riches to sleep with her. <laughs> nice. Right, of course. Cause, because a woman does a, a work, a piece of creativity that's about sexual things, and therefore that means she's having sex with everyone. Um, we all know that art is just reality, literally. Um, of course. So what was Palestine like at this time? So Palestine at the time is part of the Ottoman Empire. There's actually a Young Turk revolution in 1908 with uh, Arab nationalism and clashing with Zionism. Gotcha. So there's there's some political unrest going on there. Um, yeah, what, what did she see? Does, do we have any descriptions from her perspective about what she saw there? No. I'm sure that would have been interesting, though, her being Jewish. Though her family was also quite involved with, naturally, the Russian Orthodoxy of the time. So not the most religious of Jews. Mm -hmm. That makes sense um, that a lot of times we see Jews become more assimilated if it benefits them materially or politically. Um, because you can, you can get oppressed more if you're more visually Jewish or you know, you're practicing more. So a lot of times people just kind of quietly assimilate to the culture if they see that that's going to get them less violence and more jobs. Yes, but anyway, all of the gossip about the nudity, the Arabian princes trying to sleep with her, all of this leads to the production being censored and uh, shelved for now. She would put on a more private show where she would strip down to a brassiere and a skirt of beads. Mm -hmm. Now, she does end up joining Diaghilev and Bax, in the founding season of the Ballet Russe, to star in Cleopatra opposite Nijinsky, a now famous ballet dancer. Uh, this caused problems, major mm -hmm. problems. The prima ballerina of the Marinsky Theater, the most prestigious ballet group in Imperial Russia, was Matilda Shesinskaya, and she expected to have the lead role. Mm. Uh, now note, this is the woman who was the lover of two grand dukes, and when someone commented surprised about it, she responded, What's so surprising about that? I have two feet! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so she's into feet. Um. It was rather odd for her to be the lover of quite a few powerful people. At one point prior to his marriage, she was also involved with Tsar Nicholas II. Okay. So specifically the comment someone had made was about how she had two Grand Dukes at her feet. Mm. And she was like, I have a Grand Duke for each foot. Right. I still think it's a feet thing. But anyway, go on. So even though two ballets were to be performed and she would star in the other, she was unamused to not also be the lead in Cleopatra. And so she got the subsidy to the ballet revoked. A hundred thousand rubles from a Grand Duke, gone overnight. Damn, petty. Yes, so the newly created Ballet Russe is penniless and out on the street. Mm. So Diaghilev went touring Europe for funding. He did get it. Uh, they would open in Paris instead, in a theater, in a theater that Diaghilev actually renovated it for. It was quite dilapidated, so they poured money into that. Ida would still be the star as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess they were really committed to that if they were willing to lose funding over it. Did it succeed? <laughs> was all that worth it? It was sensational, and Ida was mesmerizing. Uh, one person said, Words cannot describe the reception given to this first night. Success, triumph, 
The words convey nothing of the exaltation, the religious fervor and ecstasy which took possession of the audience. Anna de Nois, the darling of the salons, would write, No one thought that in the realm of art there might be something utterly new under the sun, when in instant splendor there appeared the phenomenon of the ballet russe. It was as if the creation of the world had added something to its seventh day. When I entered the loge to which I had been invited, and I arrived a little late, for I had not believed the several intimates who promised me a revelation, I understood I was witnessing a miracle. I was seeing something that had never before existed. Everything that dazzles, intoxicates, and seduces us had been conjured up and drawn onto the stage. There it flowers as naturally, as perfectly, as the plant world attains its magnificent under the influence of the climate. Wow. So she liked it. Everyone loved it. Mm -hmm. Though naturally her sister and brother-in-law didn't attend. In fact, they'd never see her on stage. She didn't particularly care her. She would act so very differently with her family involved compared to everyone else. So when we previously mentioned... So when she would go to each person in her production and speak to them in their native tongue, she could be very cold to her family instead, in contrast to that warmth. Gotcha. Oh, so the native tongue thing was about her being like personally considerate to each person, making them feel welcome and connected. Yes. I guess that is too bad, then, that she didn't feel that with her family. Yes, so many people would acknowledge her as kindly, well-bred, and well-mannered in behavior, uh, and then others would report that she could be uncaring, unkind, or even cruel when relate when dealing with her family. Oof. Of course, <laughs> the same family that did put her in an institution because she wanted to do a controversial art piece, so um, that makes sense. Indeed. And with this opening season of the Ballet Russe and this scandal that horrified her family, of course, her fame is launched with notoriety. So in addition to everything she's done now, her family were even more horrified because of so many pieces involving nudity or simulating sex on stage. Ida, on the other hand, goes on and befriends the great Sarah Bernhardt, the premier French actress of the time. And also a scandalous individual, but everyone loved her. Yes, though unlike Bernhardt, Ida was a private person, so we don't know nearly as much about her. Gotcha. So do we know if anything happened there? Nothing happened there. Now, uh, she would also begin to keep exotic pets and constantly get scratches from them, though she never worried about that and other people did. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, like, there's a lot of diseases you can get. Even from, like, house cats, you can get diseases from scratches from them, so. Yeah, she had more like a panther. Wild. (laughs) Including including cubs. Uh, One guy who was visiting her ended up jumping onto one of her coffee tables because the small cat, the cub, wanted uh, to pounce on his coat. Oh, no. And Ida, Ida laughed, grabbed the cub by the scruff of the neck, and took him to a different room. <laughs> wow. Fearless lady. So she also then goes on to star in Sherizad, another shocking piece. And the ballet russe is actually at this point responsible for the raising of the value of Russian bonds as they spawn trends in other art forms and stimulated commerce. Wow. Dang. Now, since she's befriending Sarah Bernhardt, she is also just naturally falling into the artistic circles of Paris, including Robert de Montesquieu, an acquaintance of Romain Brooks. And uh, Ida is actually the only woman who Montesquieu slept with in a rather disastrous one night stand that uh, they sort of agreed to forget and remain friends afterwards. Oh, no. <laughs> no, does. Is she bi? Like, because previously she doesn't seem to have been having much interaction with men or women. Ida is bi. We know of two lovers, one man and one woman. Gotcha. But they come later. Mm -hmm. Instead, we first have, through Montesquieu, the return of the gnome. She (laughs) meets 
Denunzio. Not the gnome. <laughs> so remind us who Denunzio is. Denunzio is an Italian writer, rather bombastic. Also, he has Eleanor Deuce, the Italian equivalent of Sarah Bernhardt, as his mistress. He beds a great many women. He's a womanizer, despite the fact he's not very good looking. And you really should look him up on Google Images just to understand how much he looks like a gnome. Yes. So Ida meets him and she becomes a bit of a muse to him. She's also used as an art model by various other artists, including the painter Romaine Brooks. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, she goes on to fall in love with Romaine. She wanted to run away to a cottage in the country with her, which was not Romaine's style, though Romaine didn't stay in one place all the time she moved around Europe, including also at one point the U.S., but mostly between France and Italy with a base in Paris and later on Nice. She was not uh, one to simply hide away in the countryside. Gotcha. This, however, did not stop her from painting Ida. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure that she got a lot out of that sexual tension still. Yes. On the other hand, there is Denunzio, who creates the play St. Sebastian for her to perform as the saint, a Jewish woman performing a male Catholic saint. Mm -hmm. Interesting choice. Also, isn't he the one who's like historically a homoerotic saint? I'm pretty sure. If he, he's the one who gets um, shot with arrows, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's the homoerotic. Everyone needs to Google image search St. Sebastian. Um, all of every single image of him pretty much is very sexy. I, I mean, you think about, you know, your, your naked muscled man who has arrows penetrating him, um, and how that could potentially be seen as homoerotic. Um, yeah, so, so an interesting choice for her to play as a bi-woman. Yes, in fact, uh, Romaine also paints this. Mm -hmm. She paints Ida as St. Sebastian with a gnome or dwarf shooting an arrow at her. Mm -hmm. As we discussed in Romaine's episode, there was an almost weird sort of triangle involving these three of Denunzio wanted Ida, who wanted Romaine, who really wanted Denunzio's friendship without these weird romantic minded women chasing him to her house and for him to also take her seriously as an artist. Mm hmm. That's really too bad. But also, I love that it's a whole gnome piercing her with an arrow. Like, that. yeah, yeah. It's pretty on the nose in terms of imagery. Yes, but uh, this whole thing greatly upset the Catholic Church. <laughs> you don't say. Yes, in fact, a cardinal decreed that the papal index has banned all of Denunzio's written and dramatic works... And then the Archbishop of Paris condemned the play and uh, forbade all French Catholics from attending performances on pain of excommunication. Dang! Now, do we know if this play itself was actually like that scandalous or was it just that she was a lady playing a male saint? So the church was appalled that a woman and a Jew was going to play this male saint. Gotcha. So they... <laughs> As with a lot of church responses nowadays to religious uh, themed shows and other art, it's more about the politics of the representation itself. They haven't actually watched it. They don't know what it has to say, and they don't care about that. Really too bad, because I think there's a lot of cool things to do when you're interpreting something religious rather than just taking it straight from where it's written. Yes, and despite this, the piece goes ahead and is a success. And then Ida meets her next lover, Walter Guinness, an Irishman who would go on to a distinguished political career that included the Undersecretary of State for War and a cabinet position. But she liked him for their shared love of travel. Mm -hmm. Which is how she ended up on safaris with him and her pet panther. <laughs> love it. Like, did she have a leash for the panther or something? I believe so. I've seen a photo of her holding what I assume is the panther. It's, it's definitely not a house cat she's holding, and it does look like it has a leash and a collar. Okay. Guess if that works. If he was cool with it. 
Apparently he was, though he was married. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. What, was his wife cool with it? If she knew, I'm assuming she was. I mean, I guess he would go on to have political positions, so it's not like this affected his career too much, but... No, which is rather odd to think about, because, like, today you would assume paparazzi all over the place, it would be front-page news, but it, it was quite hush-hush. Yeah, I guess they could keep things like this secret back then. Apparently. By now, Ida's husband has realized that she's never going to be a traditional wife in any sense of the word, so he demanded a divorce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair. Yeah, poor guy. <laughs> He's like, maybe she'll change her mind if she just sees how much I love her. No. So do, do they get the divorce? How does that happen? Ida uh, rather weirdly refused to see or divorce him. A divorce, then it should be noted, required a witness to adultery or some other marital crime. And though her husband, Vladimir, did have her followed by a private detective, uh, he never found anything pertaining to her and Walter or her and Romaine. So the divorce never happened. Dang. Yeah, so I guess they just, they didn't have, <laughs> they didn't make paparazzi like they do now. And I guess you no. were saying that she was a more private person than a lot of these figures, so. Yeah, she was more private. And anyway, Vladimir just sort of fades out of her life. Mm -hmm. We don't hear any more from him. <laughs> mm -hmm. She then actually leaves the Ballet Russe to form her own company and to produce her own works and seasons. Though she insists on always dancing in them, which is not necessarily the best choice. Mm -hmm. So as one person put it, so many near masterpieces were presented that season. One lamented the fact that their inspirer was not content to play the role of the super impresario. Mm, so she was kind of pulling a Kenneth Branagh there. Um, <laughs> and maybe there would have been other people who were better for the part. Yes, so Ida was not the best ballet dancer. It should be noted, uh, for the time, Ida was Ida was quite tall. Mm -hmm. Oh, and she that's was, not what people usually want in a ballerina. Not at the time. At the time, they wanted, as Romaine noted when she was around Ida and her classes, uh, the teacher would praise the plus petit pupil. Mm -hmm. And Ida was seen as too tall. Uh, by the time you get to the 1970s, the 1980s, there's actually a reversal of that. Mm. And ballerinas are supposed to be very tall rather than shorter. Mm -hmm. It's odd how things go. Right. Beauty standards and all that. She also tried to be an actress, which also didn't really go over well, except for a role Sarah Bernhardt coached her on, uh, which was the lead in The Dame of the Camellias a role that Bernhardt herself had played. Many actually believe, including Colette, that she should have stuck to mime. Hmm. Interesting. Which kind of combines, like, ballet and traditional acting in that ballet, you don't speak, you do it all through gestures. Um, yeah. Interesting. Had she done much of this? The, the mime, that is? Yes, some of her earlier performances had included miming the roles. Mm-hmm. At one point, she actually agrees with her old colleague, uh, Nijinsky, to work on the fawn with him, but then she disagrees with his choreography and refuses to be in it. Dang. All right. So I guess we see this is why she created her own company, is because she wanted to have control. <laughs> yes. So then along came World War I. Love it. My favorite section of this show. <laughs> yes, so at the outbreak of the war in 1914, she is in Switzerland with Romaine. Upon hearing the news, they immediately returned to Paris, where Ida raised money, started her own hospital, and personally nursed the wounded. Wow, all right. So I guess the, the, the Kenneth Branagh thing is going to a good cause now. Yes, she practically abandons her artistic career 
while the war is going on and devotes herself fully to the war effort to the point where she is awarded the Legion of Honor by the French government. Wow. All right. So she's going hard. Yes. Ermain also continues to use her as a model, though instead of doing a lot of nude paintings of her, she now uses her for a Red Cross nurse in a painting that has Ypres burning in the background, and it would be used to decorate a war pamphlet to raise funds. Yeah, so even even her likeness is being super patriotic at the time. And then came uh, the Russian Revolution, which also hurt her family back in Russia. One would imagine. <laughs> so how did this go? Well, you see, considering that Ida did not particularly have much to do with her family, she didn't help them. There is actually one of her, I believe it's a great niece, tells a story of her Aunt Lulu, who survived World War II and goes to Ida in uh, England or France at some point. And uh, finally, Ida comes down the stairs and receives her. And there's an entire exchange that goes from the end. I am too upset to eat or sleep at the moment. Ida, looking suitably concerned, asked, Why, my dear? What is the matter? You look most disturbed. It is the family in Russia. What family? Lulu was shocked. Why, our family, Ida, of course. Ida's eyes seemed to glaze over as if a veil had been lowered over them. My dear Lulu, I hardly know any of them. Lulu proceeded then to beg and say, But Ida, I have received news from several of our family who are still there. News which has exposed the terrible condition, not only materially, but in all manner of ways. And uh, she proceeded to ask for, like, clothing, food, and medicine, which would cost a lot of money. To Ida, the expense would be neither here nor there, but her reaction was total indifference. It was a great shock. So Aunt Lulu came back indignant and in despair. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that makes sense. It sounds like her family really didn't approve of what she was doing. And I I can see why that rift would be very big if if her scandalous performances were kind of her life. Yes, so that occurred, and then the war is over, and she goes right back to the stage, and she also has her last performance with the Ballet Russe and collaborating with them in 1920. She does also actually perform that role from Bernhard, though it's said she was not nearly as good at it. She didn't perform it nearly as well, but she was decent. And also not as well as Bernhardt. That leaves a lot of room to be excellent. Yes. She also naturally takes to hanging out at Natalie Barney's salon at 20 Rue Jacob throughout the 1920s. She's actually very close to both Romaine and Natalie. All right. Like still remaining friends with her by now Mm ex-lover. I mean... As you do if you're sapphic. Yes, though she still has Walter as her other lover. Probably the longest running. Mm -hmm. And then she pretty much has her last performances in the 1930s. And the decline is starting to be visible. Her 1931 season in London does not go well. Mm, But what does this decline entail? So the critics were united in their disapproval and were extremely cruel to her. By this point, she's 46 and no longer the femme fatale, the irresistible seductress of 20 years before on the stage. And her stage fright is also getting worse. Like she is said to have had paroxysms of fear. Oh no. That's rough. I mean, because usually you think, oh, well, you get used to being on the stage. You know, it dissipates the more you do that type of thing. Also, can I just say, 46 is not that old. She can still be a femme fatale. Yes, but this is 1931. Right, they they can't handle older women back then. 46, not that old, again. But even that, I guess, is too much for them. Not everyone can be like Leanne de Pugy's second husband and find older women attractive. I guess. So her art is starting to suffer. Her body is also starting to suffer. One person who saw her and 
this time hanging out with Romaine and Natalie described her as starting to be much more bony Mm. at this point. So throughout her life, she would actually insist on, even if she couldn't dance, looking like a dancer, so being slim. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nowadays, we would call this anorexia. Yeah, I was going to (laughs) say, is this a health problem? It sounds like it is. Oh, yeah, she definitely had anorexia by the time she died. God, poor woman. I mean, that, that's a really rough disease to have because that's not it's not just like a physical, you know, deprivation and, and all that. But it's it's that mental eating away at you. You know, you're not good enough unless you hurt yourself. She also at this time converts to Catholicism. Oof. OK, that's fine. Whatever. It, do we have a reason for this? Yes. So while she has been in France for so long and having had the influence of Russian Orthodoxy while she was in the Society of St. Petersburg, over time she actually turns more and more towards Catholicism till her eventual conversion in 1936, which she describes as her being drunk with joy. All right. Well, I guess I'm, I'm glad that she found something that was meaningful and important. Pretty sure they condemned bisexuality at the time. Um, do we know, like, to what extent, like, how she reconciled that? Not to say that, like, Judaism or Russian Orthodoxy were, like, pro-bisexuality. I'm just saying, if you're going to convert to a religion, that means you feel especially strong about it. Um, do we have, yeah, do we have any evidence of, of her understanding of that? I think much like some of the lesbian artists and writers we've covered in previous episodes with their conversions, she probably ignored that little bit. Mm-hmm. Which fair, a lot of people today do that too. So, and but then also a lot of more mainstream religions are are becoming more chill. And now we come to the end of the 1930s, a very t- bad time to be a Jew on the continent, even if one has converted. Right, because as we know, in that time and in that place, Judaism was not just a religion, it was, and still is, an ethno-religion. Back then, it was also a race. Um, And so even if you convert, you're still of the Jewish race, and therefore, um, you know, evil and of the devil, and you like to eat children or whatever. Yes, so her lover, Walter Guinness, by then the Baron Moyne, was the one to suggest her leaving Europe at the outbreak of World War II, and he actually sets her up at the Ritz Hotel till he died in 1944 by assassination from the Stern Gang, which was a Zionist paramilitary group, Ooh, because, because by then he had been made Secretary of State for the Colonies, so he was in charge of various matters, including Jewish immigration to Palestine. Oof. And so he was off in Cairo fulfilling his political job, and he was shot. And they got him. Yeah, but was she okay? (laughs) She was devastated by this, so... She threw herself even more so into her philanthropy. So just like in World War I, World War II, she now throws herself fully into the war effort, this time for the Free French. She visited wounded French soldiers. She even paid for a wing of the hospital at Camberley and nursed wounded pilots personally. She even adopts a Free French French squadron as their godmother. Wow. They're actually responsible for her headstone at her grave. Yeah, so she just throws herself fully into this, and then World War II ends, and she doesn't dance again. Wow. Do we know and why? Just, like, physically she's not able to? or Physically, she's getting older, She and also probably changes in temperament and the developing anorexia. She's lost her remaining lover. Her house in the Place des états unis in Paris is also destroyed during World War II. So she, in 1951, moves from Paris to Vence in southern France and pretty much becomes a hermit. Do we have any knowledge of, like, what she does during that hermit time? We, We do have a little bit. So she does visit a few friends. 
She even tries to visit Romaine when Romaine moves to Nice, but Romaine won't see her. Oh no, how come? So it goes that Ida's favorite flowers had always been lilies. She had drunk champagne from the leaves of Madonna lilies. Romaine had always compared Ida's beauty to that of a lily. And then she went and turned Ida's invitation down, not for health reasons or personal animosity, but simply because she is no longer like a lily. Bitch! <laughs> wow! Okay. My ex, my ex is in town, or I guess I'm in town and my ex is there. Um, but I'm not going to see her because she's not hot anymore. Well, you see, it actually, though harsh, it could well have been because time had moved on and things had changed. So, for instance, Natalie's salon is still taking place, but it lacks the energy since so many people have died and things were just slowing to a halt. That they, they were all be- traumatized by the war that they'd all had to endure. Like, the that second makes sense one. that a lot of people were kind of not the same as before. Yeah, but one person says, all these people belong to an era. An epoch that was gone. And Ida more than any. Mm. Got it. So Romaine was like, I I don't want to be depressed by uh, how much she is not who she once was. It could very well have been that as we covered in Romaine's episode. Romaine would eventually cut herself off even from Natalie, her greatest love of her life. Simply because Romaine did not want Natalie to see her becoming old and decrepit and dying. She wanted her to remember her as she was. So it's like, she's no longer a lily. I'd rather have the memory of when she was a lily. Yeah, so it sounds like Romaine really could have used a therapist. Um, (laughs) She had some problems with the idea of aging. Romaine had many problems, as we saw. Anyway, but back to Ida. (laughs) Yes, so Ida... Ida dies of a heart attack in 1960 while on the phone with someone. We don't know who. That's scary, though. Yes, she's buried in the cemetery of Vence. But actually, the municipal authorities could legally dig up her grave because the plot lease was only for 30 years and that ended in 1990. I'm sorry, what? (laughs) That's bonkers. She does not own the plot. She leased the plot for her body. The lease was for 30 years. That ended in 1990. So, like, 30 years before we're talking now, even. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize you could lease parts of graveyards. Does that happen? Yes. Yes. Probably more so in Europe because there's less space. So another practice in a lot of different parts of Europe, including Greece, is actually that you let the body decompose in a grave. And then afterwards, like, a say, 10, 20 years, you actually dig it up and move the bones to an ossuary. Wild. So the, did they do that to her? Or is she still in there? As far as I know, she's still in there. Okay. That's less troubling, but, but the government can at any time just kind of dig her up and put her somewhere else. Yeah, I wouldn't know where. <laughs> yeah. Ugh, cool. Well, good to know, I guess. Yes, now I actually took people a while to learn of her death. So instead of dying at the height of a career when she would be known forever as, say, Marilyn Monroe was... She fades away, and it actually takes quite a while for anyone to report on her death. There's no grand funeral the way there was for Sarah Bernhardt. And as we mentioned previously, the Free French Squadron that adopted her as their godmother is responsible for her gravestone. Mm -hmm. Right, I guess, which indicates that no one else who knew her and was wealthy was willing to chip in. Or didn't know at the time. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, I guess it was harder for news to spread back then. You couldn't just text someone. No, and there were... It took a long time for anyone to report... It took a long time for anyone to report her death to people or to appear in obituaries. It probably didn't help that her secretary apparently stole her jewel her jewels and her clothes. Wow, okay. 
That's rough. So yeah, that is the life of Ida Rubenstein. So now, of course, I do wonder, um, does she appear in other people's works? How How is she remembered? What is her legacy? Her legacy is far more in the world of dance, and she is, of course, mentioned in people's memoirs. The biography of Nijinsky, written by his wife, actually also mentions Ida, though not that frequently. Yeah, I guess dance by its nature is kind of an ephemeral thing, um, as is performance. So makes sense that she isn't quite as as documented as some of our other more literary or visual or, you know, um, painterly people here. But remember, if you're going to do scandalous performances, keep your medical relatives far, far away.